Come on, let's stand to our feet today. We're so glad you decided to join us. Come on, let's put our hands together as we worship, as we sing. Let's sing it out. I saw sea full of light, light there. I saw darkness run full of color.
think about the testimony in this room today that without Jesus we were dead in our sins like that song says we were like dry bones reaching and trying to be something chasing something wondering and God saw us 
and he chose us and he loved us. So now we can confidently sing, sing things like come alive dry bones, have new life and breath and we can have joy today and we can say this is my testimony that he brought me from death to life. So can we give the Lord praise today? We thank you Jesus. We thank you, I'm so overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by his testimony today in our lives. And you know, our only response is to give him all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, all the adoration, to join the song of heaven and to sing holy, holy, holy. So can we sing that today? We praise you, Father. Yes, Jesus. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The King of Love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice Let's join the heavens today. We sing. All hail King Jesus.
today. You know, we sang words a few moments ago about the veil being torn in two. It's a reminder for some and it's new for others that in the Old Testament before Jesus, in the temple of God and in the tabernacle of God, there was a place where one person could meet with God, the high priest. There was a curtain that separated it from everything else. It was called the most holy place And the high priest had to go once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people, to purify himself before he went in because without holiness, no one can see God. And yet in one day, as God himself hung on a cross, at the moment breath left his body temporarily, the veil that separated us was torn in two. And Jesus himself became our great high priest. But it wasn't just him who entered. He invited all of us to enter in with him. That we could have access to the Father continually. The Bible says because of that, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Making our prayers and our requests and our petitions known to God. And that he hears us. It's something we know that is true. And we believe that God still does today. As we continue to worship, our prayer team is going to be down front. I invite you, if you have a need, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, whether it's financial, emotional, whatever that need is, you can bring that need boldly to God today. And someone will agree with you in prayer. But more than that, Jesus has ushered you in. So why not take advantage of coming into the presence of God and giving him your needs today? and allowing him to do what only he can do. As we worship, as we sing, as we pray and believe together, I just want to invite you, if you have a need, these altars are open right now. Let's continue in worship together.
God, can you just take a moment and say that to the Lord? Nothing comes close to you, God. Nothing is as sweet. No one is as kind or holy. No love is as good and deep and wide. We thank you, Jesus. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. We sing together. time then sings my soul and then sings my soul I How great we sing straight to him Hear the word of the Lord from Colossians chapter 2. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith and the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your old sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed, I love this, having disarmed all of the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over them by the cross. This Jesus that we've come to sing about this morning, far greater, far more powerful than we give him credit for, Sometimes I get comfortable, I'll just speak for me this morning, I get comfortable with Jesus. He is God. Fearful, wonderful, awesome, mighty, triumphing. Triumphing over every power and authority. That's who we're singing to. I love what the apostle said. He's the fullness of God. In bodily form. And I love what he said right after that. And we've been given fullness in Christ. He invites us to what the scripture calls circumcision of the heart. Cutting away of the, the old us and get, being given an opportunity to live a brand new life. I love the way that that passage ends. Jesus at the cross was taking our sin, our guilt, our condemnation. The code that was written against us. And he nails it to the cross. 
doing away with it so you and I can be free. And that, that, that part of the passage, I, I, I told the first service, I didn't plan this before coming here today, but being in the first service and being in this service, sensing what's going on, there is warfare going on in the church today. This place, not the big C church, this place, there's spiritual warfare going on for hearts and for minds. And can I just remind the powers that be and all of us in this room and all of us watching, Jesus has already made a public spectacle of them. Whatever power they think they have or thought they had, it has been nailed to the cross and our God is victorious. I, I know what the sermon is going to be in just a few moments and that may be for some of the angst of why the enemy has picked this day and maybe it's because you're here, but I'm gonna pray for freedom in Jesus' name in just a moment and I'm going to pray that we have our hearts prepared and the soil of our spirits tilled to receive the word of God in just a few minutes. Would you pray those things with me? Jesus, thank you that you are victorious. Thank you that you have triumphed over everything that came against you Death, hell, the grave, Satan himself, the powers of darkness came and threw everything they had against you. And you rose again. You scoff at them because you are God. There is no one like you, Jesus. We exalt you in this place. We exalt you in our hearts. There is no one like you, Lord, to thank you that you offer fullness to your people. You offer freedom to your people. Thank you, God, that you cut away the parts of us that were dead, the old us, and you give us a brand new life with you through faith. Thank you. God, I pray for, for every person in this room, every person watching online, that there's a battle being waged for their heart. There's a battle being waged for their mind, their allegiance, their devotion. Jesus, you are victorious over everything that would distract us from the truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you're watching online or couldn't hear in accordance with what the scripture describes, very great detail in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Uh, God moves, the spirit moves upon someone to give a message in an unknown language, often called tongues. It moves on another member in the body to give that interpretation. The interpretation was that God has never disqualified us. He loved us while we were sinners. And if we would come to him, those of us who need rest, those of us who need redemption, come to him for he is here. He is here. That's, I say this all the time. That's why you've come to church today. It's not to be with me or Pastor Kirk or to hear our, our band, our worship team sing. It's to be with him. Let's take another moment. Let's just press into him. Jesus, thank you for your visitation of your spirit today in the supernatural call our attention to the fact that you are a savior there's nothing that we have done nothing anyone can do to be disqualified from your grace you're that great your death was that special that unique that it saves to the uttermost Jesus again we glorify and we honor you prepare our hearts now to receive your word Prepare our hearts for what you want to do to all of us. God, you're not just calling sinners to you. You're calling saints deeper into you, into your knowledge, to your way, to the life of being a follower of you, Jesus. Prepare us to receive your word, all that we say and do. And then God, send us out 
send us out on mission with the gospel on our lips, hope and joy in our hearts, that this goodness, this, this redemption, it's not just for us, it's for the world around us. It's for everyone. Prepare us today to do that work this afternoon and tomorrow and the next week. We love you, Jesus. You be glorified in all that's done and said in this place and in us. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, let's give him praise. Amen. 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 We hope you're enjoying this worship gathering from Mount Para North. If this is your first time joining us, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at info at mountparanorth.com or give us a call at 770-578-9081. For more information about all of our ministries and upcoming events, check out our website at mountparanorth.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and North Podcast. Whether you are joining us online or in person, it is our hope that you will soon find North to be a place you can call home. And now, let's return to our worship gathering for this week's message. everybody. How are you today? It's good to see you. Glad you're here. Glad you're worshiping in person. Those of you joining us online, so glad you are with us as well. We are continuing a series that we began last week called Asking for a Friend. A few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago actually, we asked you what were some of the topics or questions that you had that you would always wanted to hear a sermon on, or maybe it's a hot topic of the day that you wanted to know. What does God have to say about those things? So we started last week. Um, we talked about... I, we just decided last week, let's go ahead and just get the toughest one out of the way right up front, right? So we did Christians in Politics last week. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, if you weren't here, I encourage you to go listen to that. So I decided, why don't we go ahead and get the second toughest one out of the way right up front today? So we're going to talk about Christians and culture, but in particular, what does God have to say about the, the issues of transgender and LGBTQ and those things and then how do we respond as Christians to those things in this world? Um, uh, and over the next few weeks, there are three more topics that we're going to be talking on that were the main topics. Um, one has to do with how do you hear from God? How do you know it's the voice of God when you're listening and when you're praying? Um, what about heaven and hell? What are those things? And then what about um, one of the biggest things that's facing our society today, especially in young adults um, one of the most, the, the largest issues facing college students entering college is mental health. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. So what does the Bible have to say about those things? And how do we have a biblical approach to come alongside people and help them um, with the truth of scripture um, as well in those things? So uh, today, I just want you to know, um, I'm well aware that um, uh, some of you are here um, and you have no idea what we're going to talk about this topic today. That's great. Some of you knew after being here last week or watching online that we were talking about this. And some of you have questions about it because you have a friend or a family member that's dealing with these things and these temptations and this draw of these things. And how do you deal with that? Maybe you're here because you have feelings, and um, same-sex attraction, and you're like, what do I do? How do I respond to these things in this? Can I just tell you, I am glad you are here so that you can hear the word of God. And I hope you know today, I will, not, I will not hold back what truth is, but you need to understand something. What I present is truth. Jesus said he came in grace and truth. Because anytime there's truth that convicts us of something, there's also grace that brings us out of that. And I just want you to know that I'm believing that wherever you are today, whether it's this topic or whether it's a different kind of temptation that you deal with, that God's grace would be so abundant to you today. I also realize there are some of you probably here that um, you've been Christians for a long time. You've got big opinions about this whole issue and um, you let them known to be everybody and that will listen to you. Um, and you probably, there are some of you here going, I've been waiting to hear this church or this pastor say something about this. 
Well, I just want to remind you, I've probably talked about this four times in a sermon, and this is the second complete sermon about this topic in the last two years. So if you haven't heard it, I have two words for you, okay? Church attendance. I just want you to know something, that God's word speaks to all the relevant things in our society today, but it also does it with grace and with truth. And what I believe today is God wants to speak to us in grace and truth. In Genesis chapter one, verse 27, the Bible says this, so God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the grace that you have shown us, the grace that we sang about, um, the grace that we have prayed about, the grace that you reminded us of through the spiritual gifts this morning. And I pray in the name of Jesus that grace would just settle in among us as we look at your word and look at society and look at the current temptations that people have. And Lord, your grace would be abundant to us. Anoint the words you've given me to say. And I want our ears to hear them and our hearts to receive them so that you may accomplish your perfect will. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So just so you know, I have a a, a lot to go through this morning. And I'll probably stick a lot closer to my notes because I've got statistics and things I need to share with you. Um, But there's a lot to go through. And so um, if you got the North app, you can download download the sermon notes and give you a head start on those things. Anyway, we're going to go at a pretty, pretty good pace this morning, okay? So you ready to sort of buckle in and just get to it? Yeah. Biggest thing that goes on right now when we talk about these current issues with LGBTQ, with transgenderism, is the thought of there is a difference, the thought in society today that there's a difference between what the Bible says and what science says. So if the Bible says one thing and science says the other, which one do we have to believe? Because what the common belief today is is that people are born a certain way and there's nothing that they can do about that. So what I want to give you this morning is what actual science says about it. Science that has been peer-reviewed, which means it has been analyzed before it's ever published and not an article or a study that is propaganda or agenda-driven in those things. There's a difference between those types of studies. Once again, I always tell you, If there's an article you ever read, where did it come from? If it's a scientific article, is it peer-reviewed? That's important. If you ever hear a survey or statistics, the first thing to ever look at, who paid for the survey? Seriously, these these are common sense things that we need to be aware of. So let me give you some terms that we have. The first thing is gender or sex. That is the biological classification of a person as male or female based upon their anatomy at birth. Medical term. Okay, transgender is a street or a slang term or a, 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 um, a common term, not a medical term, for someone who is biologically one gender with an emotional desire to be another gender. The same exact condition, medically speaking, is called gender dysphoria. It's a medical term, which means dissatisfaction with one's biological gender or their anatomy at birth. Homosexuality means attraction to a person of the same gender. A heterosexual would be someone who is attracted to someone of the other gender. So what does science have to say about gender identity? I'm gonna approach that, then talk about what the Bible has to say about those things. Because when we talk about gender identity, sometimes the phrase is used, a man trapped in a woman's body, a woman trapped in a man's body. What does science have to say about that? First of all, the thing I need you to know is this. There is no peer-reviewed scientific evidence of any differences in brain chemicals from those who suffer from gender dysphoria or those who do not. There is nothing chemically different in the brain from those who suffer from it and those who do not. The Human Genome Project has identified all the genes in the human DNA, and they did not find any homosexual or transgender gene. There is no gene There is no chemical difference between those who suffer those thoughts and those who do not. There are no genetic abnormalities between those who experience transgender desires and those who don't. By God's design, biology is precise. There are two biological sexes. There is every male has an X and a Y chromosome. Every female has two X chromosomes in theirs. 
Now, there is such a thing as genetic mutations. These things take place all the time, and there is such a thing as um, sexual and an anatomical genetic mutation. So genetic mutation shows up in all sorts of things, and, and it can show up in, in someone, makes them more susceptible to a certain type of cancer. Those things show up. These are genetic mutations, and there can be genetic mutations that show up in the anatomy of a child that is born um, in different ways. Th- that's a truth statement, Okay. That statement has been used over and over again by those who are propaganda-driven to drive an agenda to force opinions on other people as being very common, and we have to be compassionate about those things. I just need you to know something. That happens in about less than one out of 3,000 people that are born, which means 99.967% of people born have no abnormalities whatsoever when it comes to that. And those that are, are medically treated as soon as possible in those things. It's not something that just shows up later on, okay? A person that wants to drive an agenda by using a small sample size is a person that is not being intellectually or really honest with themselves either. It is as if someone says, I want to be right, The facts show I'm wrong, but I want you to let me be right anyway. It is what it is. So if there is no biological difference, then it has to be either spiritual or psychological. If there's no biological difference, it has to be psychological or it has to be spiritual in that. A study of a survey of Dutch psychologists revealed that gender identity is a psychological issue and most people suffering with it have multiple psychological issues that are going on. 25% of those struggling with gender identity disorder are also schizophrenic. 75% of patients struggling with gender identity disorder are clinically diagnosed with another psychiatric illness, such as personality disorder or mood disassociative order, disorder. Gender identity disorders are almost always secondary to some other deep psychological issue. As a matter of fact, Child sexual abuse is often a cause of gender confusion and sexual orientation issues, which is why the church ought to have compassion for people who are struggling with these issues. I don't mean you let down your moral code, but there are people that are walking in darkness and are struggling that can be set free by only the power of the blood of Jesus, the same power that set us free from all of our sin and shame as well. According to a peer review article in the National Library of Medicine by the National Institute of Health on July 29, 2020, 82% of transgenders had considered suicide. 40% of them had attempted suicide. Among teenagers, 86% had considered it, and 56% have attempted suicide. This is an issue that is destroying lives, and the only answer is Jesus. Science tells us the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, states that 98% of boys, 88% of girls who are struggling with gender dysphoria will eventually, quote, will eventually accept reality and achieve a state of mental and physical health. The problem is there is an agenda that's trying to push surgical reassignment, hormone, in order to let a child do what they want to do instead of allowing that child to grow out of those things. So, Ten years after Johns Hopkins started surgical reassignment surgeries in the late 1960s, they did the follow-up study with all of those people who had had it. In the study, what they found, they were not able to demonstrate that it helped a single transgender patient, and they shut the surgery down. For 40 years, until under pressure from society a few years ago, they re-implemented it. Dr. Meyer, the man who led the Johns Hopkins sexual reassignment team, was so He was the one doing the surgeries. Here's what he said after seeing the follow-up results. He said, surgery is not a proper treatment for a psychiatric disorder. 
And it's clear to me these patients have severe psychological problems that don't go away following surgery. Dr. Paul McHugh, a University Distinguished Service Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine said, transgendered men do not become women, nor do transgender women become men. And the most effective, most thorough follow-up of sex reassigned people, extending over 30 years and conducted in Sweden where the culture is strongly supportive of the transgender, documents their lifelong mental unrest. 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rates of those who had undergone sex assignment, reassignment surgery rose 20 times to that of comparable peers. So to the church, I need you to hear me. If you hear that, and you hear about the struggle psychologically people are dealing with in this, and the thought you have in your head is, see, I knew they were crazy. There is something wrong deep within us if we ever have that thought. Deeply wrong. There are people who are hurting and are struggling that need what only Jesus can give. What we know from science is this. Peer-reviewed science. There's no evidence. There's no biological difference between LGBTQ, transgender, or no, there's nothing biologically there. And there's strong evidence of psychological trauma or mental health challenges that are there. So what does the Bible have to say about gender identity? Here's what Genesis 1.31 says, just a few verses after the verse we read, how he created all of human beings and male and female, he created them. Here's what it says. Then God looked over all he had made and saw that it was very good. An evening passed and the morning came, marking the sixth day. This is the day that he created human beings. On all the other days of creation, he says at the end of the day, it is good. On this day, as he created them male and female, he said, it is very good. Genesis chapter two, verse 18 and verses 21 to 23 says this. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs, closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone, flesh from my flesh. And she will be called woman because she was taken from man. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse five says, a woman must not put on men's clothing. and A man must not wear a woman's clothing. Anyone who does this is testable in the sight of the Lord your God. So you need to hear something. That's not random. Deuteronomy is when God has brought his people who have been imprisoned for 400 years in a foreign culture in Egypt. And he begins to speak to them and says, here's how I want you to live. And anything that looks odd, I mean, if you ever read Leviticus, you just, you read through and you kind of go, the Lord said, don't do this. And you go, why would anyone think to do that? I mean, you read through it, you just kind of go, what in the world? It's the culture that they came out of. He says, you're to be different than that. I'm calling you to live differently than the culture that you've been called out of and live according to the culture of the kingdom of God. What does the Bible have to say about homosexuality or LGBTQ? Leviticus 18 verse 22 says, do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin. In Jude chapter 1, verse 7, as Jude is looking back on to the history of Sodom and Gomorrah, where this history of, of homosexuality and homosexual rape documented in Scripture, here's what he says. Don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. In the book of Romans chapter one, here's what Paul says. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turns to get the natural way of having to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. What scripture says is this. God created male and female and designed them for sexual relations in the, in the bounds of a marriage together. 
That's his plan. That's what God says. So God designs us in this way. Science backs up that we're made this way. So the truth is that there are a lot of people that are struggling out there. Not only struggling with the temptation of same-sex attraction, but they are also struggling that their friends or their family members are dealing with this and they don't know how to help them in response to this. And so for the next couple of moments, I want to tell you how should Christians respond to all of this? How should we respond? The first thing is this. Remember that we were once lost and broken. If you're a follower of Christ, you were once lost and broken. I was once lost and broken. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. But notice verse 11, he says, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed and you were made holy, and you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It says this, all the things that you see wrong in the world, all the immorality and what you consider debauchery and all of these things, all of these things that you see, that was once you as well. And never forget the grace that brought us out of that. Never forget that it was the blood of Jesus Christ that set us free from the sin and the condemnation and the darkness that we once walked in and gave us a hope and a freedom and a purpose and a destiny right now. Never forget where God has brought you from to the place where God has brought you through. Because I'm telling you, where they are, we used to be, and where they are right now, they can be where we are right now too by the power of Christ. Never forget that. And can I just tell you something? To those of you watching online in this room right now, you wouldn't admit it to anyone else, but you struggle with same-sex attraction, temptation. Paul lists all of those things out, and he lumps them together with all the other things, and he says, thieves, cheating, liars, homosexuality. All of, all of them he lists together. Every single person in this room is tempted by something. And maybe it's multiple things, but there is a primary temptation in your life that you really don't like people to know about. And right now, you're even comfortable looking around. Don't look at anyone right now, right? <laughs> we all have it. As a matter of fact, I would never, I wouldn't ask you for a show of hands, but I'm telling you, you will know this feeling when I tell you. Have you ever been sitting in a church worship service, singing, listening to a message, and the most horrible thought comes into your mind? And you think, oh my goodness, am I even saved at this moment in time? It's temptation. It's temptation. The difference between temptation and sin is when you act upon it. That's why Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 says, do not practice those things. And even if you are tempted in one of those ways, can I just tell you something? The more and more you let God empower you through the Holy Spirit and you resist temptation and you resist temptation, the less power it has over your life and the less it becomes a temptation in your life. There is freedom in Christ. And it's not just freedom about same-sex attraction and it's not freedom about transgenderism. There's freedom from whatever the temptation it is that you keep coming around and around and around and you say, am I ever gonna get past this thing? Yes, you can. But it's through the diligence of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit and you can be set free. Never forget that we were once lost and broken. The second thing is this, grieve over the condition of the lost. When Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, knowing he's going to give his life on the cross, he looks over the town, and this is what he says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39. It's not on the screen, but listen to it. Oh, Jerusalem, 
the city that kills prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is abandoned and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He is literally grieving over that city and their condition at that moment in time. I'm going to ask you a question that I had to ask myself this week. When you watch the news, when you read the news, whether it's a newspaper or online, and you see the things that are going on in the world, and it bothers you, when is the last time you grieved? I don't mean grieve for our nation and grieve for our circumstances. When is the last time you saw a picture of someone doing something you know is immoral and you grieve for that person? When is the last time instead of being outraged at behavior, you were grieved that the person was in prison and walking in darkness and they needed to be set free? It's about time the church learned to grieve again over not only the sin of this world, but the people who are in bondage to the sin of this world. Because that was once us too. And somebody grieved over us. I can tell you this, I know who grieved over me. When I was walking in the flesh and living life as, as, as a high-performing pagan, my mom, was on her knees praying for me every day. I can remember walking through the house. Her door was shut in private prayer, but I could hear her calling out my name. When the last time we grieved for someone so that God would convince them and grab hold of them and they could be brought out of darkness into marvelous light. Grieve over the lost. The third thing is this, stand for righteousness but sit with the broken. Take your stand for biblical morality. Don't, don't lessen your standards. Don't acquiesce to the ways of the world. Stand up for biblical morality. First and foremost, in your own life and in your own family, in your own community. It's okay. Take a stand politically for moral issues. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to go back and either listen to or re-listen to last week's message. There is a difference between what is biblically moral and what is political agenda. And don't confuse the two. There are some things that are biblical and some things that are simply political that God leaves to the government structures at hand. There are some things that are moral and immoral. Don't lose your love for the lost just because you stand for the righteous. Protect our children. Protect your children. As parents and grandparents, it's our job to protect our children. The American College of Pediatricians says this, quote, conditioning children into believing of a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex, conditioning them to believe that that is normal and helpful is child abuse. Protect your children. And it starts in the home. Protect them there. Teach them the right ways. And listen, there may be a time you have to speak up. There may be a time you have to speak up um, at, at your schools. You know, I'm thankful for the school systems that we have around here. Um, I'm very thankful for them. But there may be an agenda that gets put into a public school system. You may need to have a conversation with a teacher or an administrator you may need to show up at a school board meeting. Listen, but also this. If things are fast-paced, moving in such a direction that you think it's just sort of taking over the whole school system, you do have options. You do have options. You realize that, right? You can move to another school district. You can put your child into... Private school, and you say, do you know how much private schools cost? Listen, I'm just, 
Do you know how much money people spend on ancillary and extra things when it could be spent on education? Some of it's just a priority, folks. You can homeschool. You think, oh, I don't want to be a teacher. I, I get it. But don't ask, act like you're a prisoner to a system. You're not. And God will give you direction on how to protect your kids and get them in the right place. The fourth thing is this. Pray for the lost and the broken to find Jesus. Don't ever let your loathing of sin keep you from the Great Commission. The Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine said this, hate the sin, love the sinner. Jesus sat with tax collectors and pagans and was questioned about it. And he said, I haven't come to call the righteous. I've come to call the unrighteous. It's not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. The fourth thing is this. Be people of hope. Be people of hope. I get so tired of seeing Christians walking around going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? None of this is new. None of it. The scriptures we read, Leviticus, Jude, Romans, none of this popped up five years ago. It's been around for a long time. It's been around because sin has been in this world and Satan has been in this world and temptation is trying to pull us away from the relationship God wants with us. None of this is new, but can I tell you one thing? Nothing has ever stopped the gospel and Christianity continues to grow at an exponential rate because the power of Jesus is strong enough to overcome any obstacle. Be people of hope. In the late 1960s and early 70s, this country and this world was in a state that's so similar to right now. Total distrust in government, racial tensions seemingly popping up all the time. There was a sexual revolution that was going on back then. All of those things are present right now. They may look a little different. They're all present right now. And something happened then, what was called the charismatic renewal and the Jesus hippie movement collided. And people began to abandon their old ways of life and come to know Jesus. This church is a product of that movement. This church is a product of a church that was ready, willing, and able to accept everyone who would come and watch God change them. Not excuse their behavior, not put them in, in teaching positions or positions of leadership, not anything like that. They said, come. To such an extent one of my favorite, favorite, favorite meetings with Dr. Paul Walker was when he was telling me about that moment. And he said, he said, the strangest thing happened. He said, I had to have a board meeting with my church board because we had to figure out what do we do with all the people being saved and they come forward and then all of a sudden, either on the altars or on the church pews as they left, they left all their drugs and all their drug paraphernalia. He said, we're gathering up drugs in the church. He said, what do we do with all this stuff? Why would you let fear keep you from letting God use you to reach a lost and dying world? Jesus said it like this to his disciples who wanted to regulate who they went to who wanted to choose who they went to to share the good news. Jesus said, 
would you just open your eyes? The fields are ripe unto harvest. They are right there if you open your eyes. But too many times we're trying to pick and choose who we want to come into the kingdom instead of opening our eyes and letting God use us to reach whosoever with the good news. Be people of hope. Pastor Brett said it earlier. It's not we're going to be victorious. We are victorious. Why would you be people of fear when you serve a God who has overcome death, hell, and the grave and is ruling and reigning right now and is coming again to establish his kingdom forever and ever and will banish all of hell and Satan with him at that moment in time. Why would you live in fear when you serve a God who is above all things? There is none beside him. There is none above him. There is all that is below him and all will bow the knee to him one day. Be people of hope. And let hope resonate deep within you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? If you're here today, not because of this sermon topic, but just because you know when you came in this room, things weren't right between you and the Lord. And you say, I want to make a decision to follow Jesus today. I want to join with the people in the early service who made that decision and make the best decision in my life. If that's you, I just want you to pray something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice and what you did on the cross. Thank you that my sins were paid for by your sacrifice. But I now yield my life to you and ask you to be Lord of my life. Lead me through your word and by your spirit. I'll never be the same. I'm gonna ask everyone to pray this prayer profession with me. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. One more time. Jesus, I give you my life. Now with all your heads bowed, eyes still closed, no one but the ministry team and me looking around. I'm not here to embarrass you or call you out. But if that's you, you say, I made a decision to follow Jesus today for the first time or the first time in a long time. And I want you to pray for me this week, Pastor. If that's you, would you just raise your hand really high and keep it up just for a moment. I want to pray for you this week. Yep, keep them up just a moment more, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you can put them down. I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Now I'm going to ask the minister team, everyone in the room except me, eyes closed, please, out of respect for the Holy Spirit. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor, I struggle with either the temptation of same-sex attraction or I have a friend or a family member that's struggling and I just need to know how to help them. If that's you, would you just raise your hand while no one's looking around but me? I want to pray for you right now, right in this place. Amen. Man, you're not alone. Oh, my goodness, you're not alone. You can put them down. Heavenly Father, right now, you see the hands and the hearts of the people. I lift up those that may be in this room or watching online that are struggling with that temptation. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would begin to give them a grace and a peace and a power that is beyond them that they can walk in the power of your word. I pray that as they continue, Lord, to be empowered by your spirit, that they would move further and further away from that temptation until it's finally they are free from it. God, I pray that there wouldn't be a spirit of condemnation. I don't think it was an accident earlier through the spiritual gifts that were displayed here, that you wanted to remind us that no one is disqualified because of their past. But because of what Jesus has done on the cross, he has qualified us if we'll be willing to yield our lives and our actions to him. For those in this room that have a family member or a close friend that's struggling, I pray you give them a grace and a peace I pray you give them the words to say. And I pray that you give them the wisdom to know when to speak, when not to speak, so that they can reach more and more. God, help us. Help us to remember that we were once lost and broken. Help us to grieve over the lost. God, help us to stand for righteousness, but sit with the broken. 
And God, I pray that you help us never to lose focus of the Great Commission and help us to be people of hope. Because hope is not a concept and it's not a theory. Hope is a person and his name is Jesus. And we ask you right now that we would be a place that anyone who comes in this place would feel the love of Jesus Christ and would feel the power of the Holy Spirit that can set them free from any bondage. And though we stand for biblical values and the biblical view of marriage and the biblical view of male and female and gender identity, that there are only two, God, I pray that we'd be a place that the power of the Holy Spirit can set people free and they wouldn't feel condemnation when they come in this place. But your word and your spirit would be alive and the people would be ushered into the kingdom of God and delivered from darkness into your marvelous light. And we ask it and believe it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on. Can you give God praise in this place? Amen. The Bible also tells us there is rejoicing in the presence of angels when a person turns their heart to Jesus and yields their life to his lordship. Four people made that decision today. Can you give God praise for that? Amen. If you made that decision today or in the last few weeks, man, we would love to help you get started on this walk. Some of our Grow Team members will be down here and uh, just give it two, two minutes of your time and we'll help you get started. If you want to know more about getting plugged in here at Mount Perry North, discovering your spiritual gifts, um, there's a card and a seat back in front of you. Just fill that card out, take it to our next steps in the atrium, and uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you as well. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. Hope you'll be with us next week, uh, next three weeks. Remember, we're talking about heaven and hell. Um, we're also talking about um, mental health. And uh, what else did I say we're talking about, Brett? I don't know either. You're going to have to go back and rewind to the very beginning of this to figure out what the other one is that we're going to talk about in this. Huh? Hearing the voice of God. There you go. I just heard the voice of Brett that we need to hear the voice of God. All right? So that'll be coming up soon. All right? Allow me the privilege to bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Let's give our response from Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you, folks. Love you. Have a great one.